Hello friends, and thank you for joining us for another exciting Bible study with God's Word Alive. You know, I say this a lot, but I've got to say it again. This is going to be the most important Bible study that you've ever done. It's, this is so important because of the time that we're living in, this three angel message, right? I mean, every time God has done something really, really big, He always has a messenger at first, right? We've talked about that That's over right. and over. This is the three angel message, and this is the message that goes to the world right before Jesus comes. So I want to just kind of set that context. This is all about the preparation for the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is soon, friends. So this is going to be a good study at the end. Have we got any housekeeping we need to share? Yes. I don't, what is that phone number again? 479-220. Here it is. 7107. So um, we would love to hear from you this evening as we go through the study. If there's a verse that comes to your mind that might be helpful to us to help us explain what's going on in the study, we'd appreciate that also toward the end. Um, of our time together this evening, we'd love for you to send in some prayer requests. Uh, text them to this number, the 479-220-7107. Okay. Friends, <clears throat> if there was ever a time that we needed the Holy Spirit to lead us to all truth, it's tonight. Tim, would you lift up a prayer for us? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of getting into your word tonight. We want to ask in a special way for your Holy Spirit in great power to help uh, us as we discuss your word this this evening. We want our hearers to catch hold of Jesus, calling us all to be ready for his return. We want to be ready, Lord, with all of our hearts, and we're looking forward to that day. And there's we recognize that there's many of your other children throughout this whole world that still need to be reached. And we want to pray for a special outpouring of your power that would make this message that we're talking about tonight go throughout the whole world and bring this, bring this sin, sinful old world to an end with your second coming. We're looking forward to that. We're excited about this Bible study, and we pray your blessing on it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> Guys, I, I noticed that when we read the Bible, especially about the life of Jesus, that any time that he was about to share something really important, he used he used a parable or a story to do that. And you know, I think I think that that would be pretty good to do here. As important as this message is, and Tim's got a, Tim's got a, a little a parable, a, a modern day parable, a story that he'd like to share with us to get us kick started. <clears throat> I hope you'll enjoy this little this little spin as we get as we get going here tonight. Because it is going to be, it is going to be very much modern day, but all three of us tonight recognize that we've got some really difficult topics to deal with uh, coming right out of the three angels. Yeah. We've been trying to be very excited about it week by week yeah. by week, and here we are, and we know we're coming to the conclusion. And there's a little bit of fear and trepidation <laughs> in the heart and in the voice. And we want this message to come out so positively. Yes. Well, I'd like you to imagine with me tonight something that will help you understand a little bit where we're sitting, but also might get you to look at the three angels' messages just a little bit differently. Imagine, if you will, with me tonight, uh, that God made a very special call to make a very special message and he if imagine if he had called on pastor billy graham he is no doubt one of the last century's premier evangelists uh, somebody who is who has been part of bringing so many people to christ and imagine if god had gone to pastor graham and said um pastor graham you know I want you to go to San Francisco and there I want you to catch a flight to Beijing. And when you get to Beijing, I want you to go up and down the streets and I want you to preach the gospel to everybody that you meet on the streets. And now mind you, God isn't talking about just a simple gospel message. 
God wants him to proclaim everywhere what God tells him to say, and this is how it goes. I know how evil and violent you and your government leaders are. You must all repent of your wickedness and turn your hearts to the Lord. And I'm going to give you 40 days. And if you don't repent by then, I'm going to burn this entire city to the ground. You don't have long to wait, so repent now. Now you're probably reacting like I would have imagined Pastor Graham would have reacted. <laughs> Stunned. Shocked. Are you serious, God? Surely you know the Chinese government has no tolerance for Christians. If I start preaching up and down the streets, they'll have my head off within 24 hours. God, are you serious about this? And God says, I want you to preach my message to all of Beijing. Now, if, if Pastor Graham had second thoughts about a call of God like this and decided to go to the tip of South America and catch the next research ship to Antarctica, we'd have a modern day spin on the tale of Jonah, right? Mm -hmm. I don't believe that that great man would have even considered such. And I believe he would have obeyed the call of God. But I'd like to propose to you tonight that as he answered the call in our, in our little parable, so us three guys are trying to answer the call with a very difficult message tonight as well. But I'd like to begin the evening suggesting to you how that message might have sounded. I want to ask you a question. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Amen. Would you over evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There's power in the name of Jesus. There is no name under heaven, no other name given to men, whereby we must be saved. And tonight, Jesus is offering forgiveness and cleansing and victory. What kind of victory? Think about it with me for a moment and consider that this is really what the three angels are asking us to respond to. Because in the power of Jesus, alcoholics dry out. Amen. Crack addicts break the chains under Amen. the power of the blood. That's right. Homosexuals go straight under the power of the blood. Estranged family and friends forgive each other under the power of the blood. Amen. Facebook patriots become peacemakers <laughs> under the power of the blood. Amen. <laughs> hmm. Republicans love Democrats and Democrats love Republicans under the power of the blood. Amen. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? Preach it, Tim. Black lives matter under the power of the blood. And guess Amen. what? So do red and yellow and white lives. Amen. Tonight, we are preaching repentance. Jesus has the ability to change our hearts. And if tonight you have been afraid of the three angels' messages and the beasts and the marks and the punishment... I'd like you to think again what this message is actually trying to say to all of us. And tonight all of us are trying to respond to the call of God to give this message faithfully, but fully in the love of Jesus. Amen. So Rick, let's wow. get going. Let's get going. Let's move on. <laughs> wow. You know, really, I mean, that's what it, Tim, that was excellent. I love that. I love the way you put that. Jesus Christ came 
died on the cross to pay the price for our sin, but also to give us power to overcome sin. It was never mm-hmm. God's plan that sin would last forever. It was His plan that He would live within us and give us victory over that. So to get kick-started here, I want to set the context of the three angel message. It's Jesus Christ's soon return. That, Amen. That's right. Can we all agree that, that we all want to uh, allow God to search our hearts now because when we meet our Maker, when we meet our Savior, we want to be right. Don't we? We do want to be right, depending totally on Him. Uh, so, in that context, we know that God sends a message to us. And we know back in Revelation chapter 12, we talked that, about that before, that, uh, that, there's, that there was a, a war that broke out in heaven. A war, of all places, it broke out of heaven. And what was the war, what was the battle over? What was it over in heaven, this battle? Worship. Worship, <laughs> yeah. And then, and then, but what was the weapon? What was the weapon of our enemy? What was his weapon of his choice? Deception. Deception. That's how he works. And so he wanted, see, the devil, our enemy, he wanted the worship that only belonged to God. The devil and his angels were kicked out. They were kicked out of heaven, but where did they get kicked out to? Yeah. Revelation 12 tells says, woe to the earth. To hear. <laughs> because to he's hear. here now. God you know? is warning us. And yeah. let me tell you what. He was able to deceive one third of the angels. We are no match for his deceiving power. He, we're no match for it. And so it, it, he, he got kicked out to heaven. And so... True to his warning. Yeah, I mean, you see, you see, starting starting very early, right with Adam and Eve after they fell, you saw Cain and Abel, and what he what Satan did was he came and confused worship. He wanted people to think that they were worshiping God, when in reality they were worshiping him. We yeah. saw that with Cain and Abel. Yeah. God said, "Bring a lamb." Cain said, uh, "I'll bring vegetables." A counterfeit. That's right, a counterfeit, and so. Yeah. So we have these two groups from the very beginning on earth. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so true to God's warning, that Revelation 12, the very next chapter, Revelation 13, the enemy began a conspiracy to deceive God's children into worshiping Him, a system of worship, doing it His way on His day. Different from what God had, had said. So, so then in Revelation 14, that's where we've been at. That's where the three angel message is. God, like a loving parent, he's sending out this message of warning. Look, a warning. You've been deceived. I want you to know the truth. And so Revelation 14, 6 and 7, we've covered that. I'll go ahead and read it right quick. The first angel message. Then I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. God wants everybody to know. Uh, Same with a loud voice. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him. Worship who? God. Worship God, our creator, the one that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. You know, worship him. Worship me, your creator. That's what he's screaming here. Not the counterfeiter, not the one that's trying to deceive you, but worship me. Uh, and so you can almost hear his love and concern there. And then, and then the second angel that we covered last week, another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, understand this. This is God's last appeal as we get ready to dig into the third angel message. Jesus is coming soon. He's, he's about to stand up, friends. He's about, Jesus is about to come. And when he stands up, whoever's just is going to be just. And whoever's unjust is going to be unjust. This is a, a parent crying to his children, I love you. I care about you. Uh, and it, can you see, and where would God give his warning yet? If there was a warning that critical, where would he give the warning yet? His word. In his word. Yeah. See, he's chosen the Bible to be the source of truth. The only place that you can find unbiased truth is in the word of God, friends. So here's my question, guys. What is Babylon? He says, come out. He, he says, Babylon. Babylon is fallen. What's Babylon? Who gets to go first? Huh? <laughs> you go ahead. I'll keep it. Okay. I'm going to keep it on okay. a simple road. All right. Uh, Babylon is quite simply do it yourself religion. Yeah. How do I conclude that? 
I love how I was already thinking about this, but you have already brought up Cain. And you know what? I was thinking about him earlier too, because that's where DIY religion started. I'm not going to follow God's plan with this sacrificial lamb over here. I'm doing it my way. I'm going to go get my yeah. uh, produce out of my vegetable garden and I'm throwing it on the altar and I'm offering that to God. It's yeah. DIY religion. Yeah. So secondarily, we get on down past the flood and all the people are there uh, deciding they, they want to stand up against God and do it their own way. Yeah. So they're, they're, putting up the Tower of Babel. Yes. Okay. Simple stuff. But where, what is the root problem uh, going on there is I can save myself. That's right. I don't need God. Absolutely. I don't need God. I'm going to yeah. put up this big old monstrous tower. Yeah. And, and, and uh, if there ever was a flood again, which God said there wouldn't be, mm -hmm. then I've saved myself. That's right. So DIY religion all over again. No faith in God. And... You know, it, it, it at the at the basic basic level, it, it it still comes down to, do you have a relationship with God or not? Because yes. if the entire Christian religion is built on our relationship with God, if you don't have a relationship with Christ, then your religion is nothing more than a moral club or a society. Okay. Okay. Very it's, good. It's nothing. It's a d. Very it's good. DIY. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Etienne, anything you want to add to that? You know, the, the Bible talks about um, the Christian life. And of course, Babylon is the opposite of what the true Christian life is supposed to be. Um, the true Christian life involves being a living sacrifice. Okay, Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So we've already compared Abel's sacrifice to Cain's sacrifice. The Old Testament sanctuary was the epitome of that living sacrifice. There was a sacrifice done every day, twice a day, in the morning and the evening, representing Christ. He would one day come to take that away. And... 1 John 1, 9 says he would not only forgive, but he wants to cleanse. So you look at the Old Testament sanctuary. God said, build it for me so I can live among you. In order for God to live among us, we have to be holy as he is holy. The only way I can be holy is for him to make me holy. Because I have no holiness in myself. Okay. And so it's coming back. It's like Tim said. It's righteousness by faith in Jesus. Or it's my own righteousness mm, yeah. that's mm -hmm. filthy rags. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so Babylon has filthy rags. Yeah. Yeah. And you can sit in the pew yeah. every week yeah, and right. have the filthy rags. Yes. We are not immune as Christians from this filthy rag issue. Yeah. God wants us to, to have him cover us up like that, yeah. that, that son that ran off from, from home, that came home. The dad threw that robe right mm, over top mm -hmm, of him. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus wants to do for us. And Amen. so Babylon refuses to accept that robe that yes. Christ wants to put on. Yes, yes absolutely. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Babylon, Babylon. The first, uh, just adding a little bit yeah. to this. Uh, Babylon, uh, the first revelation is not the first that we've heard of Babylon. All the way about the Tower of Babel that we talked about. And then the next time we see it is the great city of Babylon. We studied Daniel 3 not very long ago. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? And he built this big golden image, right? And he and he and what did he want to do? He, he made them, he commanded them to, to bow down in worship or he would kill them, right? right. He did. He, right. he, he said, bow down. It's either, either worship, worship, the, the counterfeit, in other words, instead of the true God here. And so we know that Babylon has got something to do with false worship. We got it, it's something to do with, with, with our own righteous works, with not, with not really Sorry. a cleansing like God really wants. Okay, let's move on. Um, third message, the third angel message. Revelation 14, verse 9. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any worship the beast in his image and receive his mark on his forehead or in his hand. All right, so I just want to just stop right there and say, who is the beast? Who is this beast? Let's identify the beast here in, in Revelation 14. 
Revelation 14 doesn't tell us who the beast is. We got to go back. Right. Uh, go back to Revelation chapter 13. Talks mm -hmm. about two of them, two beasts, one coming out of the sea and one coming out of the land. Mm -hmm. When we look at the first beast, and this is what this is really is the combination of both of those that is represented in chapter 14, because um, you can't single one of those out because they work together at the end. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at the the union between those two beasts and what they stand for, they stand. Um, uh, for those uh, people in the end that um, will set up a false religious system and will force people. So through deception and through coercion at the end, they will force God's people trying to deceive even the very elect. That's what Jesus says. Yes. So they work together. The, the beast power, as Revelation 13 describes it to us, is a is a composite beast of all the animals we saw in Daniel chapter seven. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you'll see that the beast in Revelation thirteen looks like a leopard, which we saw in Daniel seven. It has feet of a bear, mm -hmm. so it looks like Grecian Empire. Mm -hmm. So it's got a Greek component. It's got a Medo, Medo Persian component. So the foundation is Medo Persian. It speaks like Babylon. Babylon. And the most important characteristic is, guess who's behind them? The dragon we saw in Revelation 12 mm -hmm. gives us his power, seed, and great authority. So God in his love is saying, I don't want you to be deceived. Yeah. I am going to lay Satan's master deception bare before you. Please don't pick him. Yeah. It's like Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. He says, I, he talked, talked to the Israelites and he said, I'm getting to the end of my road here. He said, but... I've laid before you life and death. Choose life. Mm -hmm. And this is what God's doing. He said, look, I'm showing you exactly what's going to happen. Please don't be, be deceived by these powers. Please pick me. Choose life. Okay. Tim? <clears throat> uh, I'm in agreement with everything Etienne's presenting. So I was trying to write down some points that will be different. So who is the beast? Well, a few other clues. Uh, that Etienne uh, knows quite well, but just didn't use in this in this presentation was this beast, how he was talking about how the it refers back to Daniel 7. Well, we've got other connections that go back there too. So there's the 1260 time, year time period right. that this beast power, this, uh, uh, well, it rains. It ties to the 42 months that's here in Revelation that it rains. So we know there's some more, here's some more clues that are connecting us with that power from Daniel 7. Well, the, the power in Daniel 7 that reigned for 1260 years is the little horn. Mm -hmm. we, we, di we discussed that. We studied that for yes. quite some time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, over, over this last year. So we're talking about the same, uh, um, well, power I want to. I want to say uh, power is the best word. Yeah. I'll keep Systems trying to say power. systems good. Mm -hmm. It's not a country so much, but it is a country. But it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, good. So you'll get you'll get into that. So, yeah. yeah. Um, there, there's those connections that are coming across. It's pretty clear. We're talking about the little horn here. It's the same as the sea beast, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I'll let you uh, finish up with, with your thoughts there. But I was thinking we, we really need to uh, pull out who this yeah. uh, lamb-like beast sure. is and, and explain those things coming together as well and then identify. Okay. You know, identify so C. to me, yeah, this is all good. It's, it's, <clears throat> this is all good we have here. Uh, as, as Etienne and Tim both uh, said, that, that, that uh, the, the beast here that we, we see in Revelation 14 is, is not the first time that's been brought up. We know that it was brought up in Revelation 13, but we also know, but even goes back further than that, the book of Daniel, which we did cover sure. in the book of Daniel. And, and, and when we get in the book of Daniel, chapter 7 especially, you see that, that these kingdoms, uh, these beasts 
represent kingdoms. In fact, Daniel chapter 7 in verse 17 says these great beasts. There was there was in, in Daniel you see the lion and you and you see a bear and then you see a leopard and then you see an indescribable beast. Uh, power in, in, in Daniel chapter 7. It says, These great beasts, which are four, or which were four kingdoms, are four kings which rise up out of the earth. And then in Daniel chapter 7, verse 23, uh, it says, Thus he says, The fourth beast, and the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms. So we, we see, we, we see then, and then we can know for sure that this beast then is a, is a kingdom. Now, this kingdom can either be a political uh, or a religious power or system because, because we know that from the study of Daniel. So, um, so when we go back to, to Revela- Revelation 13, like Etienne said, in Revelation 13, 1 and 2, it's describing the very same beast power here. Uh, the, the very same beast in the order of them, the, the leopard and, and, the, and, the, uh, and, the, and the bear and the lion. And the, and the, in Revelation 13, it describes it as a dragon, this, this beast like a dragon. So, uh, we, who, so who is this beast of Revelation 13? Uh, it, it's a political religious power that the Bible said we, that, that we read about here. And I just read it in verse 2 here. It says, the dragon gave him his throne and great authority. He's talking about the dragon of the kingdom here, which was Rome, gave him. So we know that after the breakup of Rome, that Rome, as it, as it broke up, it gave power and authority to this particular religious political power uh, there. So it had to be right after the, the breakup of, of Rome. And this power also claims the right to forgive sins here on this earth. That's another identifying mark. So who is this this power? It's, it can be no none other than papal Rome. It can be no other uh, power because it follows. And it's the one that re, it followed. It followed pagan Rome. Uh, was followed by papal Rome. Yeah. And papal papal Rome received its power, seat, and authority from the dragon, which was pagan Rome. Now it's very important to know here that the Bible here is talking about a system. Not a people. Very important to know that. It's not talking about, it's not talking about a people here. It's just talking about God is identifying that the devil is going to be, is going to use this system to deceive and bring in false teachings, just false teachings, just like Revelation 13 is making very clear into people. And they think they, they are so deceived, just like he deceived the angels in heaven. They think that they are, that they are worshiping God when they're really worshiping the enemy. And that's 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 as clear as as I can say it now. Um, anything else that y'all like to add to that, guys? Well, yeah. thinking how Revelation unlocks another clue too. We've got that twelve hundred and sixty time period where yeah. papal Rome was in supremacy, and it was persecuting. Uh, uh, was a, a terrible persecuting power uh, all those years, but it ended. Uh, that 1260 year reign in 1798 when uh, uh, the French took the Pope captive. Mm-hmm. Okay, Revelation refers to that as the deadly wound. That's right. Yeah, the deadly wound. Yeah. So it was in 1798 that this sea beast, the papacy, the little horn, received its deadly wound. And then Revelation goes on to tell us that that deadly wound would be healed. And this is... This and we is, know it has. That's right. It is definitely uh, in the ascendancy yeah. yet again. Yeah, good yeah, point. I mean, so, good so, point. so one thing that I just want to bring out is, is most of us believe that, that God was heavily involved in purging the medieval church from the errors that crept in because at that point, the clergy were the ones that told the people what to believe. Mm-hmm. People didn't have access to the Bible. Then with the invention of the printing press and the Bibles being translated into English and German, all these, the Bible went to the people. And once the people saw the light, yeah. they came out of the darkness of the Middle yeah. Ages. Yeah. God led all those reformers to discover different truths that we all hold dear today yeah. that came out of that. And every one of them made the same interpretation. Every one of them. Oh, I'm so thankful you're saying that because uh, this isn't new to us. No. We didn't think this up. No. Martin Luther no. pointed it yes. out. Yes, yes. Uh, John Calvin. Yep. Melanchthon. Yep. All of them. All, these, these great reformers saw it clearly, and they had a, they had a high desire to reform the church. Right. Yeah. 
<laughs> so what, what, what the next beast comes around, Wesley in 1793 wrote, where he said, they expect the first beast to receive a wound soon. And they also expect the second beast to appear. Yes, they understood so, it. So Wesley understood it way back then. Yeah. They were looking. And, and as you read Revelation chapter uh, 12, you'll see that the earth comes to the rescue of the woman, the pure woman, and it swallows up the big stream of water that the dragon spews out after her, which, which represented the persecution through all the dark ages. Yes. So not only in Western Europe, yeah. Did, did the earth help the uh, Waldenses and the Albigenses and all those faithful followers of God uh, to find refuge there? But another whole new country showed up on the scene with the beast coming up out of the earth. Yeah. So this beast coming out of the earth represents a nation that would allow the persecuted ones to come and live and safety, find and freedom, yeah. find refuge where they could worship God to the dictates of their own conscience. Yeah. And that's a good study yeah. that we could go a that's lot right. deeper that's on. Right. It's incredible study that's here. Right. But tonight we're going to go ahead and move on a little bit. Uh, what is the image? What is the image? And uh, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, what's the image, guys? Well, it, to finish following up just a little bit on what... Uh, Etienne is saying here, um, you can see that that lamb-like beast coming up in Revelation 13 is, ha is forming an alliance, so to speak, with the sea beast, with papal Rome. And, and uh, we'll, we're going to offer something at the end to go in deeper study, friends. Uh, well, I can't get totally into it tonight, but uh, we believe that that lamb-like beast is none other than the United States of America. Coming, uh, coming up out of the out of the land instead of out of the sea, and uh, this this image to the beast, the United States is going to do something that mirrors what has already happened in the 1260 year time period that the sea beast was in control. So something major is going to come on this earth uh, in in short time, but. Uh, Etienne, I'll let you finish, and then I think I've got <laughs> one more throw in uh, yeah. at a little okay. more basic the, level. The, the image, if you look at Revelation chapter 13 and you look at the, sea, uh, the land beast, you will notice that the image is different from the beast, the land beast. It's, it's something completely different. An image in the Bible, when you look at the Old Testament, images the prophet said, are dead. All right? They can't speak. They can't breathe. They're dead objects. But if you look at Revelation 13, it says that this nation, this Christ-like nation, because the Lamb represents Christ, am I right? Initially, this, this nation would be a Christ-like nation, giving people the freedom to worship the way they want to. In the end, it's going to make an image, which is dead. But it's also going to give life to it. It's going to give it breath so it breathes. So we know when we, when, we, when we put two and two together, the image is going to be something that is worshipped instead of something that God said should be, should be worshipped. But the image, just like Nebuchadnezzar's image, was dead until there was a law made that said you must worship this. Then the image became alive. So the same thing happens with this country, we believe it's going to happen, is this country is going, uh, is going to make a law that will force people to worship a certain way. And Revelation 13 says there will be a death penalty attached if you don't do it. So that's what's coming down the pipe. That's how what I look at when I look at the image. It's, it's, it's something that's set, set up instead of God, instead of something that God said, and there's going to be a death penalty attached to it if you don't do it. Okay. May Kim? I do one more basic level? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, we're all born beasts. <laughs> Did you hear me? And we are all reflecting the image of the beast when we're born. 
What is the image? It's a mirror. What is Jesus trying to do? He wants to recreate his image in our hearts. He wants to be able to look at us and see himself in us. He wants us to form an image to Jesus. Okay. We are, this whole thing of the image to the beast is still, uh, it's still just something that is not allowing Jesus to be reflected. Yeah. And you can easily find it out when you start looking at that word force. Okay. I've got to force my religion upon you. Or I have to force my religion upon myself because I'm not really into all this obedience stuff. Okay. It, it's, it's a... So we need Christ's image. Have what to we have need it. is Christ's image. And there's only one way that you can have Christ's image and that's by beholding Him. There's no other way. It's by beholding Him. It's by, it's by looking to Him. And, and, and you are transformed. The Bible says we are transformed into His image. So yeah. let's move on, guys. What's the mark? What's the mark? Because I want to. I want to make sure we're saving enough time to get uh, to the faith of Jesus, and the clock is running. What's the mark? You know, often we get bogged down when we study the Book of Revelation. We look at all the um, the imagery, and we kind of get fearful. Um, we hear about the beast and the mark of the beast and the image of the beast. But the book of Revelation is really about the lamb. You know, so often the lamb gets left in the background when we look at the book because everyone, everybody wants to hear the bad things. Mm-hmm. They don't focus on the good things. The, the people that stand with Jesus on Mount Zion at the end are those that follow him, follow the lamb. Revelation 14 right. says, and right. starts out, those that, that will follow the Lamb wheresoever He goes. That's right. So another characteristic of those people that stand on Mount Zion with the Lamb is that they have their Father's name written in their foreheads. And we kind of talked about that last week, yep. what that meant. Mm-hmm. It meant exactly what Tim was talking about, is the recreation of God's image in our lives. Mm-hmm. Um, it is the the epitome of the new covenant where God writes his laws on our hearts and put it in our minds. That's the seal of God. Yeah. That's God's mark. Yeah. So Satan's mark is going to be something opposite to that. Mm-hmm. So one thing that we have to realize is that all these things we talk about tonight will have no bearing on any of us. Mm-hmm. If we let Jesus live in our heart, yeah. we won't have to worry about what all these things mean mm-hmm. because it's not going to affect us because we have allowed his Holy Spirit to come in and seal us, write our Father's name on our forehead, which yeah. means we think yeah. like God and we act like God. The mark of the beast will be opposite to that. That's right. So, so you don't have to worry about getting the mark of the beast if you got the seal of God. That's right. Absolutely. Everyone, everyone that is not sealed by God Yes. Gets the mark. That's right. It's, it is, there are only two. Yeah. You either reflect God's image at the end or you reflect Satan's image at the okay. end. Only two. Okay. Tim? So that mark is just simply determined by uh, whose power you're deciding to choose. And, I'll, and I'm going to stay at the simplest level again. Yeah. Um, the, the folks that are that are trying to DIY themselves to heaven end up encompassing themselves with self-made hedges and rules galore to try to keep them from breaking the law. This is the enforcement of God's law by a human power. That's really nothing. That's really the same thing that's going on with that lamb-like beast and the sea beast. It is the enforcement of a religious duty by a secular power, human power. Mm -hmm. But I can do that myself. If I'm trying to put up the hedges, oh, I can't can't go above my knees in the water on the Sabbath. Okay? That's, I'm, I'm, I am attempting to create my own righteousness when I, set up my rules 
to enforce my religion. And that is the image of the beast. And it'll be, end right. up getting the mark, the mark in the hand. I want to point that right. out. Because you were, you were talking about the forehead and, and, the, and the mind accepting this. But boy, if I'm by default and not choosing Jesus to come in and change my heart, then I get it in my hand according. Yeah. You know, so it's... So uh, let me just add a little bit to that. The mark, you, you see the mark mentioned here is mentioned in verse 9. In, in verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. So it's mentioned there, and it's also mentioned in verse 11 in, in the same way. In, in both of these, notice that they're, they're, they're connected with worship. Worship. Worship uh, being uh, worshiping the beast or his image. So it's important to note then that, that uh, the, mark, the mark comes with the mark comes with worship and worshiping the beast. So now I want I want you to notice something. The very first angel message, remember it said, "Fear God and worship Him, worship Him who made the heaven and earth and sea." God is calling His children to worship Him, worship Him. The day I said, "Remember," uh, in Exodus chapter twenty and verse eight. Also uh, talking about a sign or a seal, Exodus chapter. 31 in verse 13, speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths sh you shall keep, for it is a sign. It's a sign. You can have the sign, uh, the sign of God or the mark of the beast, a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctified you. See, it's a sign that we belong to God. So when we keep the Sabbath, we rest in the Sabbath, we, and also we rest in the completed work of Jesus Christ, both as our Creator and our Redeemer, right? As our Redeemer. So the Sabbath is not, it, the Sabbath is more than just a legalistic requirement. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it causes us to rest in the atonement of Jesus Christ and what He did on, on the cross. All right, and that we are we're totally made right, or we're totally made righteous, totally dependent upon Jesus Christ, and not anything that we can do on our own. The uh, I like Tim said, the mark of the beast is just a human attempt to substitute a human day based on human authority. So, uh, all right, let's move on now. We've got let's move on. Um, let's look at what now this is a big question here this is one of this is my favorite part of all this what is all this that the mark and the in the in the, the beast and the image what does all this have to do with righteousness by faith uh and and i mean which is what it's all about that's our faith is what saves us right what does every bit of this have to do with righteous by faith guys i uh I'm going to go ahead and jump to my conclusion, so I may be silent okay. when you get there. Okay, that's fine. But if you want me to answer this, it's going to go something like this. The, we're talking about heart work. We're talking about Jesus changing hearts. And I, I cannot help but bring up, again, I'm sure I have before, the parable of the five wise and five foolish virgins. How is it that the five foolish virgins who are in the church, who are carrying the lamp, who know the word of God, who like to hear the preaching, who like to be associated with the people of God, how could they possibly hear the uh, bridegroom say, I don't know you? Yeah. How is it possible that somebody could answer an altar call and go and say, Lord, I, I believe I want, to be, I want to be in your kingdom, but then yet turn out to be one of the five foolish virgins and, and find out that, that Christ has said, I don't know you. This has got to be the most terrible words in all the Bible to hear something like that from Jesus. But there... He's trying to get through to us tonight because, again, it's about heart work. And, and with the five foolish virgins, we are talking about, Jesus described it in another parable of the sower, where he is sowing the seed to the stony ground hearers. They like it. 
It springs up in their hearts, but they are on stony ground and there's no root. And so they don't last. Tonight, our, our dilemma is in examining ourselves to see if we are in the faith. Is in going to Jesus and saying, Lord, I recognize I am a faulty sinner. You've got to come in and fix me. Mm. I can't do it myself. I can't overcome anything on my own. And I can't even be obedient to anything without your power living in me. So to me, the bottom line is still coming back to righteousness by faith is faith in the Son of God's ability to save me fully. Yeah, amen. And that's what he's calling us to. Yeah, yeah. Full salvation. I want yeah. you ready when I come. Yeah. It's total trust in God for salvation and for righteousness is what it is. Nothing that man's done, nothing that man could ever do, nothing that I could do, it's only what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Etienne? Before I start uh, uh, my little spiel here, just want to re remind you guys that if you have any special prayer requests you want us to pray for tonight, please start sending them. Yes. And again, the, the number is 479-220-7107. Um, I'm coming back to a part that we covered last week, and that had to do with the cleansing of the sanctuary. Um, the judgment. There is a third temple, not one, that's going to be built in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Romans 12, 1 talks about it, where it says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 talks about the same thing, that our bodies are the yeah. temple of the Holy Spirit. As Jesus is cleansing and blotting out sins up there to remove them as far as the east is from the west, casting them into the ocean, the depths of the ocean, and putting them in a place where nobody can ever remember again, he's doing that in my temple. That's mm. what he wants to do in mm. my temple. Mm -hmm. um, two groups of people at the end. The ones that say, Lord, I love your law. Write it here. Right, it is. You can't yes. tell me how high to jump. Yeah. You've done so much for me. Yeah. So much for me. Yeah. I owe my every breath to you. Amen. Mm -hmm. I am but dust. Yeah. Please help me. Clean my temple. Yeah. Let me be holy. Because you know, when he when he had them build that temple, he wanted them to be holy like he is holy. Yeah. He's he's got the same desire for each one of yeah. us. He's in that process at this time to cleanse us. And he's the only yeah. one that has the power. Yeah. We cannot do it. We can be good, but we can't be holy. We can't yeah. cleanse our temple. And no. man can't pick, no. forgive you of sin either. No. Only no. God, only Jesus Christ can do that. that. That is God's goal for each one of our lives. And he's looking for a group of people. That's what these messages are all about. Yeah. God is saying, I'm tired of lip service. Yes. I want you to walk. I don't want you to talk anymore. Yeah. The world is heard too much yeah. of this and yeah. hasn't seen any of this yeah god yeah. wants us to become real amen allowing his spirit to take full control look if the holy spirit lives in my heart i'm gonna walk just like jesus walked i mean mm -hmm. john says that am i right yeah mm -hmm. if we profess that we are his children we should walk just as jesus walked first yeah. john if he lives in your heart yeah i am not going to be rebellious can't Jesus did not commit one yeah. sin. And if I really let him take control of my life, he will help me to be like he is. It's really all about Jesus, guys. You know? It really is. And that's, that's the reason I want to move yeah. on here uh, and to, because we got where our time is, flee, is fleeting by. And uh, I want to get to this, these next few parts because we're going to find out that it really is all about Jesus. 
Um, Revelation chapter 14, verse 10 and 11. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength in the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and who receive the mark of his name. Okay, what is this wrath of God? What is this wrath of God? And how does this, how does the righteousness of Christ fit into this? Because it's got to be. Everything that we study, friends, has got to be studied in the backdrop or in the context of the cross of Calvary. Or or we'll never understand it. So what is this wrath of God? And and, and what is this righteous, how does this righteousness of Christ fit into this? I'm going to go... Back, I'll say it again. I'm going to go to the simplest level again. This wrath of God yeah. is very much the same as how he puts an end to the whole sin problem. Because at the end of earth's history, the, uh, the, uh, the whole field is going to be ripe. It's going to be fully weeds and tares, or it's going to be fully wheat. Mm-hmm. And... God is just simply saying, look, I need you. I want you. I'm begging you. Get back over here onto the wheat side because when I come, it's too late. There's not another chance. Jesus says that uh, when I come, my reward is with me. He that is just, let him be just still. He that is unjust, let him be unjust. The wrath of God is putting an end to everything. And when he comes, what happens to all of the wicked? Yeah. They pass away from his brightness. Right. It's yeah. over. Yeah. That's the wrath of God. Mm-hmm. He snuffs out their life. Yeah. Now, that's a hard thing to accept about mm-hmm. a loving God. That's yeah. something, you know, that's another it, thing for another study. Yeah. But God is saying, I do not want you to receive that end. Yeah. Come, choose life. Yes. Choose Christ. Yes. Amen. Yeah. yeah. And I want to just say something before Etienne here that to, to just compliment what you said there. The wrath of God, friends, is God's judgment against sin. Yeah. And Jesus, Jesus took that wrath on the cross of Calvary. So Etienne. So Hebrews ten thirty one says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God has two sides. He's just and he's merciful. When you look at um, Matthew chapter 26, you'll find Jesus in the garden. Okay. You got two minutes. Yeah. Jesus is in the garden. He asks his father several times, please let this cup pass from me. Yeah. Not your will, my will. The cup that those who refuse to accept Jesus' sacrifice on their behalf and His righteousness on their behalf have to drink the cup that Jesus drank for every one of us. That's right. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, Jesus wants no one to be lost. There's no reason for any human ever to be lost. He says in Matthew, I think it's Matthew 25, He says, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. No humans! ever came in God's mind yeah. when he had the destruction of wickedness and sin in mind. He doesn't want anybody to, to be lost. He has paid the price. Amen. Yeah. We have to right. accept that. Amen. And allow him to reign in our life. That's right. Amen. Jesus took the wrath, friends. That's right. If you didn't get that's that, right. that's the righteousness of Christ right there. Jesus took the wrath. Everybody's got a choice. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he and he knew what was before him, and he was he was in there, he said, Take this take this cup. Talk about the cup, the wrath of God. Take it away from me. Yeah, it, but he said, But not my will, but your will be done. See, it was the separation. The the wrath of God is God's judgment against sin. And and, and Jesus took that wrath. And we see in Matthew twenty seven, verse forty six. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, uh, which is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the wrath of God. It's the wrath against sin. And Jesus took it. He took our sin. Everybody. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's a righteousness of God in this message. Nobody has to experience the wrath of God. If you let Jesus, just don't reject what he did 
on the cross of Calvary for you. Okay, um, we're, we're moving in here very close to the end here. Uh, the very next one, Revelation 14, 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. I'm going to wrap it up here, guys. Okay. We just got a, just a few minutes here. What, what, is, what is the patience? You know, patience is something every one of us need. It's, it's just something that, but none of us can have patience. The patience of the saints that he's talking about here, during these life hours, they're going to have to go through all kinds of trials and tribulations. And there's no way humanly possible that we can have patience through the trials and tribulations that God's people are going to have to go through in these life hours without the, uh, being connected to Jesus Christ. Amen. Patience, friends, comes only the way you can have this kind of patience is by abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's the very same thing with the commandments of God. The, those that have Jesus Christ in their heart like we've been talking about, it won't be them obeying. It'll be Christ's obedience through them, through a connected relationship with Jesus Christ as He abides in them. Mm-hmm. It, it'll be His fruit. It'll be a fruit of a relationship with Him. And the faith of Jesus. Uh, there, as we wind up here, the faith of Jesus. What is the faith of Jesus? The faith of Jesus is simply what it is, says. It's the faith of Jesus. It's, it's a gift that comes from Jesus Christ. He's given each one of us a measure of faith. It's faith to be able to trust God. Not to lean on your own understanding. Not to trust in your own righteousness. But to trust the Word of God. It's, it's the faith of Jesus. And it's the faith of Jesus only that we're going to be saved by. And it comes from Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans ten seventeen that faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. As we spend time in the Word of God, as we spend time abiding in Christ, the Word made flesh, He will grow this faith with, within us, friends. It Amen. is a gift from God. So our patience is a gift from God. Uh, the keeping the commandments is a gift that comes from that abiding relationship with Jesus. And the faith is a gift that comes from God also. Amen. So, friends, we have covered a lot of ground here. Uh, I don't even know. We really ain't got time for any wrap-ups here uh, because we got some prayers that we want to lift up here. Um, we got to um, we got to pray for Susan and uh, and for her, her daughter's relationship. Uh, praise God. We need to pray for that and give God an opportunity to work. And we need to pray for Angela, and 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 we need to pray, and and, and we we need to pray for some uh, very dear friends of ours in Texas, uh, that that part of our church family that we know is is part of this family right here, and uh, it's kind of an unspoken prayer request right now, but but you know who we are, who we're talking about. So, guys, we did a great job here. This has not been an easy study. Hmm. Uh, we have got a magazine. Tim, would you like to share that? Yep. I just wanted to say, friends, if you would like to study deeper, this is an excellent source for a brief but deep study. Uh, 40-something pages in this little magazine that will go over everything we've been talking about over the last several weeks. And if you would like one, you can text to 479 220 Seven one zero seven, and let us know that you want a copy of this amazing magazine, America and Prophecy. That's right. What we, the subject we've talked about tonight, you could spend hours and hours and hours and hours. There's books and books and books wrote on this, uh, and and so um, we, what we did is we just covered the very top uh, of this. So we hope what we've done tonight is is we have made you thirsty. Now this is in the Bible. We, we we this is not something that that we just made up. We it's not, and we've been real faithful to do this, friends, throughout uh, ever since we've started about a year ago. What we've done is we've looked at the Bible, and some of the things are a little bit harder to talk about, but but we've dealt with it, and we we pray that we've done done that in a Christ-like way, and that uh, that you have realized that that this is a morning that God's given us. And so you need to take it seriously and maybe dig into the Bible. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, dear God, for your word. Uh, we thank you for loving us. And we thank you that, that we know that you are coming back soon. Uh, I pray that for each person that's out there watching and listening, maybe they've heard this for the first time. I just pray for the Holy Spirit to impress upon their heart to dig deeper and study more into this subject. And in Jesus Christ's name we pray. 
Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. And we're going to recap a little bit of this next week. So uh, please invite your friends and join us next week. God bless you. Bye-bye.